don't know what you have. All right, if someone could just read um, verses 1 through 15. Four? Yeah. I have an ESV, so I don't know if everyone will be okay with that. I got KJV. Everyone would like okay, this. So I'll read the ESV. Um, so now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. When he turned aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. And they said, then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know. For there was no one besides you to redeem it. And I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also require, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her a conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life, and a nourisher of, the, of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. I'll pray. Lord, my God, we, we praise you, Lord. We know it is you that has given us life this day. We know it is you that is continually providing for us. We know, Lord, that even as we come here today, we know that it is your word that we come to, to hear. And so, Lord, I pray, I pray that you would help me to, um, to teach your word. Um, that you would help me to draw out what your word is saying. That I would be faithful to the text. Uh, that you would uh, help me to refrain from error in any way, O oh Lord. Um, I pray, I pray that you would uh, use a feeble man like myself. Uh, to teach your word to your people. Uh, I pray, O oh Lord, that you will be glorified in the teaching. In Christ's name, amen. 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 All right, so we'll start off with a recap. Last time we were in um, chapter, we were finishing up chapter 3. So in, in chapter 3, verse 16, we see, we spoke of the un uncertainty um, that, that there was on all sides, right? Naomi ends up um, coming up with this plan to to send Ruth to meet up with Boaz, you know, to put on perfume, best clothing, and to go and kind of, you know, show, show her interest to Boaz. Um, and we we said that the, the, big, the big thing here was that, you know, she was sending Ruth not knowing what would happen, right? Um, there was no such thing as texting or any of that to, to get updates. 
She kind of sent her off. She knew that she could be deemed a prostitute going to, to visit Boaz in the night because that's what prostitutes would do. Um, so there's uncertainty on Naomi's end, right? And Naomi isn't sure. There's uncertainty on, on Ruth's end because Ruth, you know, after her interaction with Boaz, uh, he says, well, there's, you know, I would love to redeem you, but there's someone that's a nearer kinsman than I, and I must go and talk to him first. So although she showed, she showed much interest in, in Boaz and she wanted Boaz to redeem her, um, there was uncertainty there. And it was the same thing with Boaz. Boaz, although he was willing to go and, and to, to, to find redemption for Ruth, it was, he wasn't sure that it would it would be him that would be redeeming him. Um, and so there's there's a bit of uncertainty on all sides. Um, and we, we we spoke on verse 17, right? Um, and in verse 17 it says, She said, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said, Do not go to your mother in law empty handed. Right? And here we kind of see uh, a beautiful picture of of what uh, of, of something kind of developing, right? She repeats, "Do not go to her when giving her the barley, right? Go not empty-handed to your mother-in-law." And this is beautiful because we don't see this in the previous verses when when she's when Ruth is interacting with Boaz, but we see it in this verse when she's interacting with Naomi, and. The, the word empty here, we spoke of how it's the same word that is used in chapter 1, verse 21, right? When Naomi spoke of being brought home empty, right? She said, I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. So essentially what, what was being drawn out here is that... Um, Naomi's empty days are, are, are over, you know, they're being, um, that God is, is, is fulfilling her empty days with, with, with promises and, and, and she's, she's able to eat now. Um, and you know, this, this whole plan between Ruth and Boaz is developing and she may even be redeemed, right? Um, so that's a beautiful picture kind of that we see of, of, of Naomi through the interaction of, of Ruth and Naomi. Um, and, and we spoke of many times we feel empty, right? There are times where we feel uh, burdened and weary and we feel lost and we feel, you know, we're, we're, like we're, we're, we're laboring hard, but we may not be seeing a lot of result um, and we feel empty. But the reality is, you know, God is still working in the midst of, of our feelings. Despite what we feel, he's still working. You know, he's still working to, to use us um, for his redemptive plan in, in, in one way or another, whether we see it or not. And it's the same thing for, for Naomi and, and Ruth and Boaz. And then in verse 18, uh, we see the difference between you know, Naomi in the beginning of chapter 3 and, and, and Naomi at the end of chapter 3. Right, Naomi's advice here is opposite of what she had said in the beginning of chapter chapter three. First, she would, you know, in the beginning, she was telling her she came up with this whole plan: go see Boaz, go do certain things. And now she's saying, then she said, "Wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until he he has settled it today." Right. So, essentially. Ruth, Naomi, Boaz, they're all kind of stripped of self. It's not in their hands. It's, it's ultimately in God's hands. And although Boaz is able to go and try to redeem, he, he's not the one that's going to determine whether or not he's going to be able to redeem Ruth. Um, it's, it's in God's hands. And um, well, there are times in where you know, we, you know, we have to just sit and pray. You know, we have to wait and pray. We have to be patient with the with the Lord and and just see how He's going to um, to guide us and where He's going to lead us. And this is the picture that we're seeing here between 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 uh, Ruth, Boaz, and Naomi. We moved on to chapter four. So from chapter three to chapter four, we kind of see a shift. Um, instead of 
uh, interaction between Naomi and Ruth, we now focus on Boaz and Boaz's interaction. And we said that Boaz went to the gate. Why, why did he go to the city gate? Um, what, what, was, what was his intention of going to the city gate? To ask the elders if he can redeem her? Uh, almost, but... That's no. where the transactions took place. That's where the transactions took take place, right? Um, we spoke of the, the city gate was like the, a funnel, right? You have all the people kind of fun, funneling, funneling, funneling in the city, and they're, in, they're coming in and out. This is like the best place to find the nearest kinsman, right? Um, this was also the place where what was most commonly used for legal businesses, right? To, to, to kind of gather the elders and, 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 and have them as eyewitnesses to any legal transactions or business transactions, right? Uh, one commentator had said the importance of, of the elders was uh, their importance was such that any transaction attested by them was of unimpeachable, uh, unimpeachable val validity, right? So it was, if, if they witnessed something, if they witnessed a transaction, it was essentially sealed, you know? Um, and, and this is what Boaz was, this is why Boaz was going to the city gate. He wanted to, one, make sure that he, uh, he was, he was, he was going to see the nearest kinsman. And two, he wanted to be around elders that would be able to be witnesses to this transaction that was going to take place. So he sees the, the nearest kinsman. He presents the reason why he comes to meet him. Um, and he kind of initially he starts off, he presents it almost in a way in which, um, you know, this nearest kinsman, you know, cannot deny, you know, the offer that is being given to him. He's saying... Hey, there's, there's Naomi's land. Uh, you're the nearest kinsman redeemer. Someone, you, do you want to redeem it? And of course, you know, his answer would be, yeah, of course. Like, I can expand my, my, my land and my, my, uh, my, um, my uh, earthly possessions. So, of course. And Naomi is not of age where I need to provide an heir, you know, to her. I'm just going to provide the land and, and look after Naomi. Um, and he says, so he says, of course, so, he, so, so Boaz presents it almost like on a gold platter for, for, for him to kind of take it. But then he lays out a condition and he says, if you redeem the land, then you also have to redeem Ruth. And he makes sure, he makes sure to say Ruth the Moabite, right? Um, cause that in a sense was the clause, the Ruth being a Moabite. Um, notice he doesn't speak of the character of Ruth. He doesn't speak of how Ruth is, you know, um, you know, caring and loving and committed to, to her mother-in-law, Naomi. He, he just says Ruth the Moabite is. So he presented it in a, in a, in a gold platter and, and then he comes with the condition so that, you know, in hopes that the nearer kinsman redeemer would reject this, 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 this um, reject redeeming Ruth and Naomi in the land. Um, and an example that I put here is like, it's sort of like, you know, when we, when we see something or when we get a deal and, and we hear that it's free, right? And as soon as we hear that it's free, our eyes open up, we're willing to take it. But then we have like a clause, it's free, but you have to, you know, get, you have to, get it, you have to, send in a, a rebate and you get your money back and you have to pay for shipping and all this stuff. And then we, we, we definitely don't want it. Um, so it's some, something similar to that effect has happened here with, with Boaz and the nearest kinsman redeemed. And he ends up denying, he says, you redeem it. And he ends up, you know, we, we end up where we are now. Or, or Benito, it's like buy one, get one free. If you see the free, like go, you go it's to more get like it. buy two, get one. Yeah, yeah, something <laughs> like that. You know, fifty percent off or something like that. Or it's like everything else. There's a catch. Yeah, exactly. But we know that um, Boaz did this intentionally, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he wanted to present the good and then present the bad, so that the bad would, uh, at least the bad in, in the eyes of the nearest kinsman redeemer. Um, so that would be like the last thing on his mind, you know. Uh, so that he would, you know, he would deny. 
Um, the, king, the Kingsman Redeemer was he a man of Christ? Um, it doesn't. It doesn't specify that whether he was a man of Christ. It just says you know he was nearest kinsman redeemer. Okay. He would have been an Israelite though, for sure. He would have been in the covenant yeah. of Israel, so we don't know if he was truly in. But then also, it's all part of the sovereignty of God, because if you look at the lineage to Christ, it's Boaz and Ruth. So you know it was God's. You know it was God's will. For uh, the other fella to reject it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, so in a sense, it's God who put the catch in there so he wouldn't take it. Of course. I mean, God. His providence. It, it, but God uses, you know, us and our, our character and, and, and our personality to kind of accomplish his will. You know, we see in the life of Paul and how Paul had his own, like, his own personality and character was displayed throughout the epistles, uh, and he used he used his his character and personality to accomplish a lot of things in the way that he accomplished it. So, so the nearest kinsman redeemer denies right, and and Poaz essentially um, is is able to redeem Ruth. And now we kind of pick up where we left off. So verse nine. It says, Then Boaz said to the elders and to all the people, You are my witnesses today. I have brought from the land of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Shilion and Malon. So Boaz kind of begins, you know, his kind of last speech, and he directs his attention to, to his to the witnesses, right? Obviously he he addressed his his attention to the elders. That's why he called the elders there. That's what they're there for. Um, but he also kind of addresses the bystanders, right? He says to the elders and to all the people, right? And and the the people there weren't just there just to just to watch. They were also acting as bystanders, right? They were they weren't just there as spectators. They would they were there as legal witnesses. Um, and for, for Boaz, this is important. He wants as many people there to witness, you know, the response of this nearest kinsman redeemer. Um, yeah. No, oh. sorry. So Boaz is ensuring that the deal is sealed and is being attested by all those who are there. Um, right. Back then, there was no such thing as like a journalist. <coughs> Uh, or a reporter that's writing every word that you say and, and broadcasting it to everyone, um, <coughs> which we have today. And it could be a blessing and it could be a curse, right? Um, there was no secretary to take any minutes. There was no journalist. Um, so he was kind of relying on the crowd. Um, he was relying on the witnesses that were there so that this transaction would be safely established. In Boaz's eyes, the more people there... Uh, to witness the transaction, the better. The more, the merrier here, in in Boaz's eyes. So they witness it, and he acknowledges he acknowledges he acknowledges that they have witnessed the transaction. Right? It, it, he says, "You are witnesses today, and I have that have brought from the land, from the hand of Naomi, all that belonged to Elimelech, and all that belonged to Shilion and Malon." So. The deal is, is sort of sealed, and he has his witnesses. We move on to verse 10. He says, Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon. So Boaz acquires Ruth the Moabitess, and this is the first time we actually learn who Ruth is actually, was actually married to. She was married to Malon. And we see that he says, Ruth the Moabitess, right? And this this stands out because this is the first thing you know that that he's acquiring at least he's pointing out that he's acquiring he's acquiring roof this is this was what was most important to boaz that he would be able to redeem ruth um it's it's obvious that it's the main thing for him uh and although it's it's implied in the previous verses uh, that he's going to redeem the land He's not placing emphasis on the land, right? He's he's placing his emphasis on Ruth and, and his ability to redeem Ruth. 
um, and everything that, that comes with her. It's almost as if like the land and the land that he was going to acquire, it was like at the back of his mind. Or he wasn't even thinking about it. He was thinking about Ruth. Um, and, and obviously we, we, we know that there's a, a huge interest from Boaz to Ruth. And he says, I have acquired the widow of Malon to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses to today. So aside from being able to, redo, to, to redeem Ruth, we learn the reason why he does redeem that which he wanted to redeem, right? He wanted to continue the line of Elimelech. Um, so though he, he shows much interest in Ruth, we see that although Ruth is the main thing, we also see that what's causing him to want to redeem Ruth is that he wants to, to be faithful to the customs of the land, right? And he was very willing to fulfill, to, to fulfill the customs of the land, right? Um, he wanted to, um, he wanted to raise the name of the dead upon his inheritance. He wanted to provide a son that would carry the name of the uh, of the deceased. He wanted to make sure that Elimelech's lineage didn't die out, as opposed to the other guy. He he didn't want to. Um, he he didn't he didn't want to. Um, this is the very reason why the nearest kinsman redeemer did not redeem Naomi's land and did not redeem Ruth, right? He was trying to, um, and he, he could care less about the customs. He, he could care less about the law, the laws of the land, um, you know, what we read in, in, in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy, he could care less. All he wanted was the land, right? And as soon as he said, as soon as Boaz tells him you got to redeem the Moabitess, ah, never mind. I, I don't want it. You, you can redeem it. Um, so, so what we see here is kind of a picture of, of preservation of self, right? Because the nearest kinsman redeemer was, was trying to preserve self and advance his earthly, uh, uh, his earthly possessions, he wanted to redeem uh, Naomi in the land. But as soon as Ruth is mentioned, never mind, right? So it, it is the preservation of self um, that, that causes this man to deny um, the, the, this redemption. And, and kind of what we're seeing here is the, the less consumed we are with self, the more we can serve others, right? And the more consumed with self, the more we tend to disregard the needs of others, right? His, his eyes, the, the, the eyes of this nearest kinsman redeemer were only on self and, and the advancement of his earthly possessions. As soon as someone else is brought into the picture, as soon as he has to, he has to sacrifice more and, and, and be more selfless, forget about it, right? I don't want it. And, and, and that is the case with a, lot, with, with, with a lot of people today, right? You tell them, you know, you, can you do this or can you do this? And, you know, they may be willing, but then you say, oh, can you do it for this brother or this, this person struggling? Or you, gotta, you have to commit this amount of time to helping this person out. Or you have to spend this much money to help them out. Forget about it, you know. Or if it's going to interfere with, with their life, you know, or, or from, 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 the, from uh, earthly possessions being denied, Forget about it. I don't want it. Yeah. And it's crazy because look at the honor. Technically, look at the honor God bestowed on Boaz as being a part of the genealogy of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah to come. Because of that humility, that faithfulness. And look, that man doesn't even understand. Like, he technically could have been a part of the genealogy of the Messiah to come. And he, in a sense, he was cut off from being a part of that because of his consumptuous self. Mm -hmm. You know, that's such an honor. Boaz yeah. was so blessed by God. Yeah. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. Also, I was wondering back in those days when when there was a woman, uh, a Moabitess or not, just any woman that needed to 
to be redeemed. I could be wrong, but I think it was a fairly common thing that they would do it, that they would redeem the, the uh, widow because uh, that was the custom and they were usually faithful. But I think uh, God is using where this fella was a very selfish fella. I think he's like the exception to the rule that he, he don't want to do it. And, it's, and it, it was done purposely by God so the scriptures may be fulfilled. Yeah, I mean, um, he's not the only one that wasn't willing. We'll kind of see in a little, little bit uh, another example, but but really, like what Mark was saying, like like the, the he didn't see the big picture, you know. He was just focused on on here and now, and mm -hmm. a lot of times that, that, that's that's what happens with us. We're just focused on like here and now. We're not focused on like the bigger picture. Like self denial could lead to, you know. God using you to mm -hmm. to further advance His kingdom, you know, and it, it may not be, uh, you may not see it with with physical eyes, but in the spiritual realm, God is working, you know, and God is using, you know, denial of self and and, and our selflessness to to advance His kingdom. It also says, "He who is lifted up shall be brought down, abased, and he who is humble shall be exalted." Mm -hmm. you know, and that's the same way that Christ was. God and he humbled himself so low and God exalted him and in the same way that we when we humble ourselves low and we make those sacrifices you know those those small sacrifices for the sake of love you know for the sake of showing Christ in us you know God exalts us for that we tend to not see that though because we're consumed with ourselves you know yeah I mean yeah I have a question um probably a naive question but when they say they're redeeming the woman so that they can carry the name yeah how do, how do they carry the name if he's not part of um, Naomi's, she, he's not Naomi's son, so he wouldn't have the same name? Yeah, so if, well, you're essentially redeeming, it would be Ruth, right? They would, they would, they would um, have an heir or a child with, with, with Ruth, and the line, the, the lineage of that family would continue to be carried on. You know, because from Elimelech, it would be passed down to one of the sons. The sons, right. Yeah, and because they both died, mm. there's no one to pass down, like, to, to, name, to get right. his name passed down. So, you know, the Redeemer would, would essentially pr produce an heir with that widow, and then that name, that, that line, will continue to be preserved and continue to be carried down. And that's kind of what we're seeing. So, here. so like they adopted him into the family, basically. Well, he was in the family. And he was. He was. He was distant, part of the family. Distant relative, right? Uh, isn't Boaz like maybe a cousin or a distant cousin? Yeah, he, he's like a family member of yeah. Elimelech. Right. Right. Um, he might be. A, it might be his his father's brother's son, or you know, two generation second cousin or whatever. Yeah. So they they were they were within like the family of Elimelech, and then having that heir would would allow for the, the lineage okay, to continue. Now I get it. Yes. Right. And so if they had another son, that then that would be his son, his son. considered his son. So it would still, like it would be an adoption, but in a sense, now he he anything that's Elimelech is his. It's his. And that's why the other guy rejected it because then his son wouldn't get it wouldn't be his family. His family. Or his um, nuclear family. It was like Judah. Remember Judah? Yeah. Well, we'll speak yeah. with Judah and Tamar. Um, so, so what we're seeing here, kind of, is um, in Boaz's desire to to one fulfill like the customs of the law. Like he was obedient to the law. Like it was his desire to. Like it wasn't only like selfish desires just because he he had a lot of interest in Ruth that he wanted to redeem Ruth obviously that was like the main reason but he also wanted to to carry the name um of of uh, of Elimelech and he was willing to kind of sacrifice so we're seeing through through the actions of Boaz selfishness selfless selflessness being demonstrated um he was willing to preserve the line um and he, he wasn't solely focused on growing his kingdom and advancing his his inheritance. Uh, he was he was on a target mission to to preserve the line and to redeem Ruth. Uh, and this would require sacrifice. The land was not going to be his. It would be the heir that that he would have eventually with Ruth. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and, and do, you think, do you think it makes a difference that God could have just made him be the direct kin? And we wouldn't have really learned that lesson, right? It, it, that the fact that he wasn't, he had to kind of make it happen. Mm -hmm. Kind of not really see that was a big sacrifice for him. Because he didn't have to do any of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it was, it was Ruth's nobleness and, and her integrity that, that really attracted Boaz to, to Ruth. Um, and, and that kind of sparked the rest of the things to happen, mm -hmm. right? So it was kind of, you know, a bunch of different um, things coming into play. I think it's beautiful too. Like we kind of see the spirit in the Old Testament here, you know, like the spirit of God, like that humility, that love, Christ likeness, mm -hmm. you know, through the law, through his obedience to the law. You know, to me that's so beautiful because yeah. the spirit of God works through that, you know, in these, in these men like Boaz. That's beautiful, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's it's something that we must pray for, right? We, we must pray that we would have the the characteristics and the attributes that Boaz displayed, mm -hmm. you know, to to a foreigner like, like Ruth. So we continue on to verse 11. It says, All the people who were in the court and the elders, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel, Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in a path and become famous in Bethlehem. So after Boaz expresses his, his intention to redeem Ruth and to continue the line of Elimelech, the people pronounce a blessing to Boaz through the, through the life of Ruth. Right? They pray that God would make her like Rachel and Leah. Um, and and what, why does he say this? Why does he say like elders? Rachel and Leah? The elders? Why do they say this? Yeah, or the people. Yeah. Because the two women, they're the, uh, they're the mother of the, tw the 12 tribes of Israel. Exactly. Um, so from, from Rachel and Leah, we have, what, we have the 12 tribes, right? From them, from their sons, those, the, the, that's where the 12 tribes of Israel begin. Um, and what, it, what, she's, what, their, what their, you know, with the blessing... What they're doing here is saying that the line of Israel will continue just like, like, like Rachel and, and Leah. Right? This shows us that they knew uh, that this was the hand of God in, in, in this redemption. Right? Like they didn't attribute the redemption to anyone else but to God. Right? I think they just prayed for the grace of God on their marriage too. You know, like as we do. You know, when we see two people getting married... You know, pray for the grace of God, you know, in their marriage. You know, they knew Ruth was a, a, a noble woman, you know, but they still need prayers. You know, they still need God's blessing on their marriage. Yeah, and, and, and more and more what we're seeing is the shift between, um, um, from, from Ruth, like, you know, how, how now she's not the Moabite. She was just the Moabite a couple of verses before, now she's the woman. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the prayer is that, 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 that she would be like Rachel and Leah, right? Like Moabite is kind of throwing out the window. Like they don't even see that anymore. They're starting not to see that. They're just praying blessing over, over her, you know, invoking intervention on behalf of God um, toward Ruth and toward Boaz. So just as Rachel and Leah had built up the house of Israel, so they pray, may Ruth build up the house of Israel. May Ruth and Boaz build up the house of Israel. Um, and it says, and may you achieve wealth in Epaphras and become famous in Bethlehem. And this is more of just, a, in general, expresses a hope for prosperity in a broad sense. The faith right. that they had that, that she would bear children is remarkable. Right, right. Um, the like that that is something that like caught my attention also it was like you know for her for them to even just just pray that and, and kind of like it's almost like they they knew that she was gonna have a baby like mm. you know they they prayed it with confidence it's not like I, we hope we hope you're gonna have a baby and everything's gonna be expanded like they kind of almost like like knew. they almost knew it yeah it's like prophetic the faith. But yes. like also yeah, isn't this like like it's sort of like a miracle in itself 
because normally somebody who's not in a, is not an Israelite, they would be considered unclean, you know, because uh, you know the you know the outside people, you know, they were different, and and for her to be accepted, you know, so fast, you know, into the uh, the family. You know, I mean, that's sort of like a miracle in itself. Yep. I mean, we're seeing kind of like the hand of God just, you know, um, through the life of, of Ruth and Boaz. Verse 12, it says, Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. Um Obviously, this is referring to Genesis 38, um, who, who speaks of Tamar and, and the house of Perez and, and Judah. Anyone is can anyone give me a like brief synopsis of Genesis 38? Okay. Probably Judah had that. said that he was going to give his third son. The first son was evil, and he died. Er. Er, and then Onan died because so he did not want to carry on the name of his brother mm -hmm. married to Tamar. He didn't, yeah, so God took him. So first thing we see, just sorry, I'm just going to stop. First thing we see is the same thing that happens in the life of Ruth, right? She, um, Tamar needs someone to redeem her because her husband has died and they're following the custom <laughs> also. Yeah. So now it's down to the third one and I think it's Sheila. Sheila. And the father, who is Judah, promises he says well wait and he'll grow up and i'll give him the, th the third one but he really didn't want to do that because he figured she's bad luck she's a black widow wife or something you know all her husbands die so he doesn't do that and she finds out that he's he's lied and and did not give you know the best intention so she plays the harlot she gets pregnant by him as a prostitute like she pretends she's a prostitute he gives her a few things to hold on, which is her leverage, um, a signet ring, a staff, and a, an animal he was supposed to give. But she has a signet ring and the staff to hold on, waiting for the goat or whatever animal he was going to give her. And she never comes back. He goes looking for her. And he says, where is the prostitute from this area? And everyone says, well, there is no prostitute. So he figures, let her keep this stuff. I don't want to get caught. Later, he finds out and wants to stone her. She's because she's pregnant uh, and was not married. And she says, I am pregnant by the man who owns these. And she holds them up. And it's, he says, you are more righteous than I am. Mm -hmm. And, and she then twins. she has <laughs> twins and Perez. Perez and Perez, something like that. I don't know the names. Well, Perez is, Perez is, is, is one of them. That's why he's being mentioned here. Um, exactly. So thank you for giving us that, that synopsis of Genesis 38. So, so this is kind of the um, same thing we're, we're seeing in, in Ruth in, in, in the aspect that Ruth needed to be redeemed and um, Tamar also needed to be redeemed and she kind of went and, and, and made sure she, she was redeemed um, and, and Ruth also makes sure, you know, she does everything she can to, to, to make sure she's redeemed. Um, and and they, they bear two, two sons that will become the ancestors of the tribe of Judah. So what similarities do we, do we see between Tamar's story and Ruth's, and Ruth's story? And what are some of the differences? The furtherance of Israel, Israel and the genealogy, the promise, the promise, the promise people is continuing. Two dead sons. That's the, that's, that's the, <laughs> that's the, that's the um, sim yes. that's a similarity. Yes, a yeah. similarity. Two dead sons. Two dead sons. <laughs> what else? God's blessing on a really crazy situations. Yeah. In both. Yeah. What what was uh was Tamar uh Israelite? Yeah. She was? Yeah. I don't think so. You don't think so? I, I have to read back, but I I, I thought she wasn't. Um I thought she was. Um what else? What what are some differences between the two stories? Well, one gets pregnant, and then that is redeemed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is more honorable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
how do we see how do we see God's hand in the in um how do we see God's hand in, in Tamar's story? Well, I mean I believe Perez is in, I think Jesus is in that line as well. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, and so right. you, of course. you see the, the good, the bad, and the other way of that line. And, and also didn't the other son die because he he wouldn't <laughs> He wouldn't. He wouldn't honor God's pledge to, that was, to that was So I see God in that. Right. So it's very similar to what we have in the Book of Ruth. The first, the nearest kinsman redeemer wouldn't, didn't redeem her, didn't want to. Onan didn't want to. Is is it Onan or Obed? Uh-huh. Onan. Onan. Okay. He does, but he doesn't. Yeah. He's hesitant. I mean, yeah. So just read, just read Genesis twenty-eight. And you'll kind of understand. It's a strange I mean, story, but... It all goes back to Jacob, too. I guess that's like something similar as well. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's <laughs> essentially from the same line. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so there are some similarities that we see here. And what, what, what essentially they're saying is, uh, Moreover, may your house be like the house of Paris, whose Tamar bore Judah. So they understood the concept of of Tamar and Judah, and they understand the concept of Boaz and and uh, and Ruth, and they see the similarities here. Um, and and so 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 we see we see that they understand that God is the one that provided in, in Judah and Tamar, and what they're asking is that He would continue to provide between with between Ruth and Boaz. Right, so we see kind of the consistency of God in providing for His people, right? In both both cases, yeah. Oh, and I, I was uh, whenever I read it, I always was thinking that, um, not get off my thought. Uh, they, 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 they were always were thinking of it in the sense that, just like they those people, even though it was bad at the time, are now accepted into the family of God, and so in a way, they're hoping she will not be accepted into the family of God. Because mm-hmm. there are examples of, of people who are not, who, who came in in a way that would, would, would seem bad at the time, but now they're accepted as being uh, the mothers of, 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 of Israel. Okay. The verse says, through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. Right? And similarly to how uh, Candy has already mentioned, we see kind of their confidence um, in in God and how they will provide uh, God will provide an offspring to Ruth right um, is there any mention of the character of Boaz or Ruth in, in in this in this blessing right is there what do you mean like is is she saying are they blessed are they saying bless you because you know Boaz you're such a good guy and, and let God give you an, a child? No. no. Right? It's kind of what we, we see is God provides, you know, despite, you know, despite, despite your, you know, when we, when we look at Judah, despite Judah, Judah's, like, sinfulness and, and, you know, him lying to Tamar and delaying and, and not giving him, not giving her one of the sons that, that he promised to, he still provides. And, and, and in this case, Boaz is, you know, a man of integrity, a man that is noble, and a, a, certainly he will provide, you know, like, that's, that's the picture that, that these people have in their head, is, is look, at, look, look at Judah and Tamar, they provide it, so this is kind of what's given them confidence to pray this, this blessing over a Boaz and Ruth, yes? I was going to say that God is rewarding Boaz's faithfulness where he really wanted, uh, he really wanted Ruth, but he followed, uh, he did the proper thing. He first went to the closer relative, and he did what he, what he was supposed to do. And, uh, you know, he probably could have covered it up and, uh, you know, oh, you know, we couldn't find anybody. And that fella, he wouldn't have said anything because he really didn't want to do it in the first place to take Ruth. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's just that the whole plan, the way it was worked out, God's hand was on it completely, and Boaz did everything he was supposed to do by faith, 
and now and now he's being rewarded. Yeah. And and if 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 Judah was not as as noble as Boaz, and Judah had twins, you know, will not Boaz, who is a nobleman who who, who did everything, you know, above reproach in in this circumstance, um, will he not also be rewarded with an inheritance? Yeah. Um, we see God's blessing on his obedience here too. Yeah. You know, but what I, like it's, it's amazing that God deals with sinners even this way because even Boaz, Ruth, all these people are sinners. Sometimes when I read the Bible, I forget that. You know, like these are the people of Israel and they they're in the covenant of God, but they're still sinners. Mm -hmm. You know, but God is dealing with them. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. That God could deal with sinners like them and sinners like us. Yeah, I mean, so we see that God, you know. He, he's gracious. He's gracious to the, to the worst of sinners, uh, and he's gracious to to those who are who walk in integrity and and are noble. You know, obedience. What? In obedience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. So the people knew that the source of the blessing was was de depended on the Lord, right? It was a divine gift, mm -hmm. and and so they prayed to the Lord that that. Um, that, that that this woman, a Ruth, would have a child. Move on to verse 13. It says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. So the transaction or the court case, in, in a sense, is, is, is over. They've affirmed. They've, they've witnessed. And she now, um, Boaz now gets to redeem Ruth. Um, he goes, he, he has, you know, sexual relations with her. And here we kind of see, like, the, the ultimate progression for Ruth, right? In becoming, in becoming his wife, we see, we, we see the progression, right? She, in, in chapter 2, she was, verse 10, it says she was a foreigner. In chapter 2, verse 13, it says she was a lowest servant. Um, in chapter 3, verse 9, she was the maidservant. And in, now in chapter 4, verse 13, she is the wife. So we see the progression of how God is blessing Ruth um, throughout the book. Right? So, you know, the, her, her relation to Boaz is, 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 is intensifying. Uh, and now it's at its climactic point. And it says, The Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to to a son, right? And the Lord, right? It is God who enables Ruth and Boaz to conceive. It, this is also suggesting, you know, that she was probably barren before with her with her previous husband, right? It says in, uh, can someone read Ruth 1-4? These took Moabite, Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about 10 years. Yeah, so they lived there for 10 years, and, and she didn't have a son, um, which indicates you know, she was probably having trouble to, to have, a, have a kid. And it's saying here that the Lord has enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son, right? So we're kind of... You know, potentially seeing uh, another miracle, and, and Ruth is beyond blessed to have a, a child. Um, and this is kind of hope for those that that do struggle, right? There, there are there, there are women and, and marriages um, that do struggle to conceive. Um, and Ruth potentially, most likely, she she did have trouble conceiving, and she was able to conceive after. all. All that she, she lost, she was able to conceive. Um, another thing to note that this is the only time, this is the second time that the narrator, make, the narrator mentions God acting, right? The first time we see the verse uh, Roof 1 6. And what does, can someone read Roof 1 6? Then she arose with her daughters in law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Right, so both, time, both times we see God, God's name mentioned by the narrator, God is providing for his people, right? First time it was bread, it was physical, um, and the second time was life, 
he's providing life to a family, uh, an heir to continue the, the line. So throughout the book, what we're seeing is the consistency of God providing. Like God's God's hands are all over the work that we all, all over the different works, the work that we see in, in Ruth and Boaz, right? We continue on to verse 14. It says, Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today. And may His name become famous in Israel. Um, and it's, in, it's interesting to know that I said in the beginning that there's a, a transition, right? Chapter 3 ends with Naomi and Ruth kind of dialoguing, and then it goes, it kind of shifts over to what Boaz does. And now, you know, we, you know, we, we don't really see, like, Ruth interacting in the end of chapter, in chapter 4 at all, right? We see, we see an interaction between the women, the, the people, and Naomi. We see interaction between Boaz and the people, but we don't see an interaction with the people in Ruth. Um, and it says the woman said to Naomi, right? So, so they're they're paying attention to Naomi because obviously the problem starts with Naomi. We see the the the, the book of Ruth starts with Naomi having a pro, you know problem. And what were the problems that she was having? Uh, her her, fault, uh, her husband just died. Her two sons just died. And she didn't have any food, and she was in the land of Moab, which was an idolatrous land. So that, that was, a, and she was old. Um, so no heir. No heir. No yeah. So she had loads of problems, and now what we're we're starting to see is, you know, um, God addressing all of these. You know, He has been fulfilling throughout the book, but but now we're seeing, you know, uh, the people recognizing. That God is fulfilling, you know, all the all the problems that she had. God is beginning to fulfill it. It was like a job story. Yes, yes, it is. So the women of the city are delighted at the birth of the child. Right, we've seen when she came back to Jerusalem. We saw that they addressed her. You know, and that's when she called herself Mara. She, she said that she's lost everything. They were there with her, and now when God has provided, they're there with her to, and, you know, delighted that 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 she now has a child, right? Um, it, they, it says, "Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may His name become famous in Israel." So the woman congratulate um, Naomi, and. And they ascribe what has happened to the hand of the Lord, right? Um, so this this is showing us in verse fourteen that that when we're blessed, right, others are blessed when we're blessed, right? Others are encouraged through the blessings that we receive by God, right? Isn't it isn't is it not so when we know a brother or sister is struggling, and we pray for them? Um, and we're there for them, and, and and we see God's hand working in their life, God blessing them with with that problem or that struggle that they were going through, mm -hmm. and and they've overcome it. And don't you receive like joy mm -hmm. and delight, uh, and and kind of you know, mm -hmm. aren't you comforted and and kind of happy with them? Uh, and that's kind of what we're seeing here, that 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 Naomi and the people, um, are are kind of. You know that's what's that's what's taking place here. They're rejoicing. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. rejoicing. They're blessing God's name for His work. It's amazing. And that's what we do as God's people. Yeah, I mean, obviously this 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 can only be accomplished by us like having a relationship with one another, right? Like if we, yeah. if, we if we don't have if we just come to church and and we just listen to the preaching and go home. Then this this will never be able to happen, you know. But if if we're involved in one another one another's life, and we know our struggles, and, and we're praying for one another, and we see God come through, uh, then we can be encouraged. Then we can be uplifted, and that that's what that's what the church is supposed to be. You know, that's that's what it's supposed to look like. You know, does it look like that all the time? No, it doesn't. But that's what we should we ought to be striving for. 
Um, we ought to be a, a close-knit people. Um, yes? I can give a story that we were at Grace Baptist Church in the old church, and there was a couple named Carmen and Jose, and they tried to have children. They couldn't. They tried every way, each way to have children, and I remember praying over them, and the church prayed over her that she may get pregnant if it was God's will to open up the womb. And one day, I seen the glow in her, and I knew she was going to say, and she goes up to the front of the room, and she says that she, she was with the child. And the whole church rejoiced with her. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. God had opened up the womb. And she was trying for, she was an older woman, too. It wasn't that young. You know, mm -hmm. she was in her 20s or 30s. And she had three children after that. Yeah. Um, so, so we see like that that the life of Ruth and the life of Boaz and, and, and the life of Naomi, particularly the life of Naomi, it it encourages the the, the community of people, um, and. The question that that we are and things we ought to we ought to be reflecting on is how can how can I be an encouragement to the body, you know, um, and it's as easy as, as just sharing your struggles, you know, and then sharing and coming and, and, and reporting back to, to the people of God, to, to 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 acknowledge what God has done, right? It's the acknowledgement of God, and, and what He's done for us that that encourages us, right? That kind of strengthens our faith to to kind of have this confidence you know you think their confidence is not going to be boosted up after after this of course they're confident they were already confident you know praying for her and now now she has a child and now Naomi has a, 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 a grand um, a grandson of course their confidence is going to be boosted up um, so so we ought to be finding times and moments where we could reflect on what God has done to encourage the body. So there is recognition, you know, that that she, she um, that she was empty, but now she is she is experiencing fulfilling. You know, she now has a grandchild, and verse fifteen says, "May he also be a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, and it is better to you than seven sons. He has given birth to him." So. The people are expressing some some sort of confidence that that the that, that this new um, that this new air is going to to bring to Naomi, right? It's gonna, it's like a breath of fresh air. Of course, any grandmother is, is going to be happy to have a a, a grandchild, right? It, it, you know, at least I I know from experience because Zion's grandparents love and great grandparents love him, right? Like he brings them joy you know and it's the same for every every grandparent like I don't I don't know of too many grandparents that don't enjoy being around their grandchildren uh, and and so it is the case with with um with Naomi and the women essentially they will they say that this child will mean, mean much to to Naomi Obviously, this is also a blessing because if, if in fact Ruth couldn't ha couldn't bear a, a child for, for ten years back in in Moab, she's now getting a grandchild. You know, after all that she's gone through, she's now getting a grandchild, and Ruth is obviously getting a child. So, so this this the 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 womb of, of Ruth has been opened, and now Naomi can have a child. And it says, for your daughter-in-law who loves you. And it is better than seven sons has given birth to him, right? So, so this is a big statement. Essentially, Ruth is is better than seven sons, um, and the seven sons is was conventional for like ancient Israel to have seven kids. Were, you know, obviously they were considered seven the the perfect number, the whole number. To have seven kids would be you know. Like having two in, in America, because people just want two, like a boy and a girl. Uh, it, as long as you have a boy and a girl, then you, you've got the magic number in America. Uh, 
Yeah. Depends where you're from. Right? Yeah. Good, good um, answer. Still be seven kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, girl. I don't know too many. <laughs> I don't know too many. You would say that. Close. Two and boys and one girl. <laughs> yeah. I mean, us as the people of God, of course, like we want kids. We 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 want many kids, and praise God, we know that it's a blessing. But you know, times have changed in that in that sense. Um, but. But essentially he's saying, you know, it's better than, than having seven sons. Having a daughter-in-law like Ruth, it's better than than seven kids. Um, and this is kind of just affirming the character of Ruth, right? We we read in, in uh, Ruth chapter 3 verse 11 that Bethlehem knew that Ruth was a noble woman. Um, and these women are are placing value above seven sons. Like she's, she's, she's worth more than seven sons. Um, and, and Naomi is being compensated for the two sons that she has, she has lost. She's lost two sons, she's lost a husband, but she's gained Ruth. And Ruth was there to help her get through all, all that she was going through. She was there to, 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 to be providing. And now she's, she's, she's giving her a, a grandchild that's, that's going to, you know, that's going to, um, to, to help her get through, that's going to bring joy to her. <coughs> so, how, how does the story of Ruth and Naomi encourage you to remain faithful through struggles? Because we're seeing the fulfillment, you know, of, of those struggles for Naomi. So, so how, how, does, um, how does the story encourage you to remain faithful? Yes. I think it just, it really encourages me because I, I just think of the gospel. <coughs> we are people from another land. You know, we're sinful creatures and we're, we're, we're far from God. But Christ comes and he redeems us in the same way that Boaz redeems Ruth. You know, and she's from another land. And he's an Israelite re redeeming a Moabite, you know, and receiving her and marrying her. You know, and that's what Christ does to us. We're sinful creatures, and God comes down and He marries us, and He cleanses us, and He gives us, He gives us a heavenly home. He gives us new life. He gives us so much, you know. And we have a we have a great inheritance because of Him. You know, I think about that honestly when I'm reading this, and that 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 makes me want to be more faithful to Christ, you know, and for His great love for me, you know. Amen. Yes. Um, I would say that uh, it encourages me because um. Like how you said in the end where Naomi's, like all of Naomi's problems are answered. Um, just seeing that every every cry that Naomi made was answered. Like it wasn't like, there was an unheard cry. Like everything Naomi cr like cried to the Lord about, the bitterness, you know, I have no sons for you to marry, this and that, was answered by the Lord. So I think I'm, I'm encouraged. So, so, so let's talk about that, right? Like, like what actually was answered you know from from chapter one to chapter four what are we seeing right the first thing and you guys could kind of call it out what do we see how do we see god has blessed naomi her joy was restored right the beginning she was bitter and she's definitely not bitter anymore um she you lost know, everything she she lost everything almost i mean she was faced with with, with much death and now we, we see life you know, we yeah. see, we see life before our eyes, right? And and um, verse sixteen it says, then Naomi took the child and laid in her lap and became his nurse, right? So so she lost, but she she gained life. She lost she lost her husband and her two sons, but but she's gained an heir. Um, she's gained a grandchild. What else? What else was fulfilled? I think Ruth's encouragement to, Na to Naomi once her loss happened in despair and the words that she shared with her were sent from above to be able to give her the proper strength that she needed to continue on and to have a new perspective because uh, in her darkness and it seems like depression, uh, you know, she wanted to even change her name and some people I think they're defined by depression and defined by grief in their life because it's painful. So I think I'm encouraged by the words of encouragement that Ruth was able to provide to her to let her see that there's more, that Christ isn't finished with the story. Because oftentimes we lose something valuable to us and uh, it's easy to lose hope at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the media oh. sense, uh, yeah. 
I was gonna say, we also just see like the physical sense, like food. Yeah. Like she barely had any, and that was one of the reasons why going back to Bethlehem. And then not only did he provide with providing with Ruth to be able to find to like the scraps, but then when she found favor in Boaz, like to get an abundance, which was something like that's precious, like when you're hungry. So that, like I just, that simplicity. Yeah. I mean, the difference between her husband and now, I mean, Boaz was not going to be her husband, but he was technically going to be the head of the family yeah. and the faith he had and the kindness and her husband leading them. I mean, they left when there was, it appeared that there was nothing, but everyone in Jerusalem seemed to have lived, right? Yeah. They didn't leave during the famine. They stuck it out and God provided somehow. Yeah. So just the, the view of those two men, way different. Succession, too, I would say, in the sense of, you know, her losing her children, you know, death versus life, you know, her not seeing, you know, her, her, her family being passed down, you know, seeing that death, you know, you could be discouraged. Yeah. You know, now she sees life, you, she sees, like you said, with the grandparents, you know, I believe that's a part of their joy, seeing their lineage, you know, yeah. that's, that's a part of that joy. Yeah, you know? definitely. Yeah, so we see, we, and then this is why Ruth ends it, like, is ending it with Naomi, because Naomi was, the, was the, the start of the book, and she's the ending of the book, and we're seeing God fulfilling, um, you know, all the trouble that she was having, and it would be, it would be very, um, it would be very hard if we, we went through what she went through, like, you know, we go through through death, we lose people. You know, it's it's very easy to 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 just get stuck there. You know, and just to, to pay attention on the here and now. Um, you know, and Naomi would have never thought that this would would happen. You know, like she she can never see this happen. You know, but I I think that's that's the joy that we have as as believers, right? Like we look to to something you know greater you know the the we, we look to everlasting life with our lord jesus christ um we know that we know and we, we're expecting that like this life is not it's not it you know it doesn't just end here you know we go from from death to to life you know um to eternal life i was gonna say you you can see the great faith that ruth had yeah compared to other other people. She was a Moabite, she was a foreigner. She, you know, she she was raised, uh, you know, uh, I can't think of the word, you know, uh, uh, my memory, I, simple words I can't remember sometimes. Mm -hmm. Heathen, whatever, thank you. But uh, now she meets, she meets, uh, you know, uh, her her husband and uh, and his family, and he sees how, how they were especially, and she, the love that she had for her mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. And she was willing to leave everything she knew to go with her to a place where there was a good chance she wouldn't be accepted there. But she went by faith. Like when she says, I'll, I'll sleep where you sleep, I'll eat what you eat, your God will be my God. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's sort of like when, the, when, when Peter told when uh, Peter told Jesus who he is, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. I mean, the world didn't tell uh, Peter that, and the world didn't tell Ruth that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, Ruth was clearly one of God's elect, and, and she came on strong. Her faith was so strong from the beginning. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, God used Ruth greatly to, to get Naomi through, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is, it is through fellowship. It is through the encouragement of the brother. You know, it is through, you know, coming alongside other brothers and sisters that, that helps us to get through. Um, and she obviously was not expecting, you know, uh, the, 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 her granddaughter or her grandson to, to become the lineage of, of Jesus Christ, right? That's what verses 17 and 22 kind of show us. Um, you know, neighbor, a son has born to Naomi. They name him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. And then it goes into the generation. Generations of Perez, we've already spoken of Perez. Uh, to Perez was born Hezron. Hezron was born Ram. Ram to 
Amnadab, Amnadab was born to Nashon, Nashon to Salmon, Salmon was born to Boaz, and Boaz to Obed, and Obed was born to Jesse, and Jesse to David. So we, so, so we see like 10 generations, for the 10 years that they, they, they were in Moab, and, and they struggled, we see, we see 10 generations of, of blessings that, that, that uh, the narrator lays out for us. And, and obviously it leads to the great King David, and, and the great King David is just a, a part of, you know, a, the lineage, a part of the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? When we look at the genealogy in, in Matthew chapter 1, we see kind of the linea- lineage laid out in Jesus Christ you know, being the end result. So, the 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 smaller small picture is that you know she had these struggles and and she had these trials and she was faced with with much. But the bigger picture is that you know through through Ruth, through Boaz, through Naomi, you know, we, Jesus Christ would come, right? We would have our Savior. You know, this this obviously is a story of redemption and. And she's being redeemed along with Ruth by Boaz, and it's 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 pointing to the redemption that 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 we have in in, in Jesus Christ. Um, it's pointing to to how, like like Mark is saying, we we were strangers, we were foreigners, we were not worthy, um, yet we we were made worthy because we were redeemed. We were redeemed by one that could redeem us, right? Boaz was was able to redeem Ruth because he. He had the inheritance to redeem her. Um, um, he was definitely willing to redeem her. Like there was a, a strong desire to redeem her, and he does redeem mm-hmm. her. Um, so, we, we, what we're seeing here is 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 the picture of how God works through the lives of feeble people. None of these none of these people were 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 great people. We even looked at Tamar and Judah, and they weren't they weren't very great themselves. But yet, they're they're still part of the line of Jesus Christ. They're still part of the lineage of Jesus. Um, Ruth Ruth was a foreigner. She shouldn't even be in the lineage. But God put her in the lineage because God God will will for her to be in the lineage, and, and she's part of it. Um, and she and and she show, she shows a great picture. So what we're seeing, what we're learning, is that there's always a bigger picture, right, than than what we could see. Right, right. Most of the time, we're just focused on one situation, but it's always part of like the bigger picture of God's redemptive plan, and God is always using it to accomplish His His will, His sovereign will, in our lives and in the lives of others around us. Um, we also learn just like just by looking at the character of the the character of Boaz. The character of Ruth, the character of Naomi, we can learn much from from these from from these people, right? What can we learn from Boaz? Like, what are some things that that were drawn out through these studies? His unconditional love that he showed, that selfless love that he's giving, you know, to to redeem Ruth, and you know, it was a sacrifice he made that he was willing to make, yeah. you know. He was, he was an upright man. He was an upright man, right? He was a noble man. He was kind to his workers. He was kind to his and workers. And he was loved by them, which shows a lot, too. Yeah. And he pursued Ruth. You know, although initially Ruth came to him, right after he, you know, he, he saw that she was interested, he did everything he could to to um, to redeem her. Um, what about Ruth? What can we learn from the character that, that Ruth demonstrates in the book of Ruth. To be steadfast throughout all situations, like especially trials, mm-hmm. and just to depend on the Lord as your anchor for mm-hmm. and To trust Him, especially when we don't see the outcome of what may to come, what may be to come soon. Yeah. Um, step by step, day by day. Yeah. And then one of the studies I brought out, like, how Ruth, like, she built her confidence in knowing who she was before Boaz, right? Mm-hmm. Like, her confidence was, you know, slowly building up because of her relation with Boaz. You know, and the more we see ourselves as children of God, 
you know, the ones that, that whom God loves, the one whom God died for, you know, the more the more willing we'll be to, to approach the Lord, the more the more desire we're gonna have to approach God. I also think like something really beauty beautiful and powerful about this passage is how Naomi, though she was cast down in the beginning, you know, God upheld her and God provided for her. God was gracious to her. You know, that, that struggle, she was down in the depths, but God really kept her, you know, and God showed her grace, you know, and that gave her joy in the end. Amen. Right? And then lastly, Ruth. So Ruth, what do we learn? What, what characteristics? You mean Naomi? Naomi, yes, sir. I would say from where we can, we can learn faith, too, because in a sense... Though she knew she would not have a child and she would not get married, she gave herself and she really cared for Ruth to be married, to have children. She wanted to, she genuinely wanted to see that for Ruth, mm -hmm. you know, and God blessed her for that, you know, that trust, you know, that giving, you know, she was giving of herself and teaching Ruth, you know, what she should do, instructing her. And that she was being very selfless, knowing that she would do that, you know, mm -hmm. that's like a lack of, I see a lack of envy there. Mm -hmm. Usually we wouldn't want something for someone that we can't have. Yeah, mm -hmm. that that's like supernatural. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad yeah. you have the same. Oh, I was gonna say also, uh, Naomi. At times, she was waning in faith, and it's like God gave her Ruth, who was so you know headstrong. You know, she was she wanted to serve this God that her family served. I mean, she had a real a real desire, and I think that gave Naomi a lot of encouragement. You know, uh, I got, you know, she's so willing to come. I have to show her everything. And then, you know, uh, through Ruth, her faith got restored and she was blessed more than she ever thought she would have. Also, Naomi struggled in that way. She would not have seen that grace and that joy, you know, those, those afflictions, those struggles. God is working those for good, you know, for our good, for our salvation. That's beautiful. Amen. Well, I'll close this out in prayer.